Welcome to episode 51 of the Strength. I am thrilled to bring my friend and colleague Carrie Clark, a speech language pathologist who is the founder and owner of the Speech Language Kids website, Speech and Language Kids, as well as the new SLP Solution brand. <laughs> Very exciting things happening. Um, so through her websites, Carrie breaks down complex research and theory into step-by-step -step guides for treating a variety of communication problems. But today we're going to be talking about another <laughs> side of Carrie. Carrie is also the mother of two young children, one of whom has sensory processing disorder. So Carrie, Why, welcome thank back. Thank you. I'm excited thank to be here. Yay. So I have asked you to come on the show today to speak Again, not as a speech language pathologist, but first and foremost as a mother. So let's just start by if you could give us insight into your transition into motherhood. Can you think back to that time and what that was like for you, both sort of logistically in terms of what your life was looking at, looking like at the time, and then emotionally, of course, any of those relatable raw early mama feelings that you can well, I'm, okay so i'm gonna preface this with my son is almost four he'll be four on valentine's day and um i feel like the last four years of my life are fairly blurry and i think it's all the sleep deprivation <laughs> so to the best of my recollection <laughs> dot 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 <laughs> um but let's see so i was working in this the public schools as a speech language pathologist and knew that we were going to start trying to have kids um and i wasn't super fond of the idea of working all day at the schools and putting my little one in child care and all that um so i started my own private practice pretty much around the same time i went i quit my job at the schools i think like my last day at the schools was right around when i found out i was pregnant um, and so I was starting that business and my website business while being pregnant <laughs> and trying to make all of that work at the same time, which some days went really great, some not so much. <laughs> um, and so then we, once we had him, I, uh, I worked part-time, I guess you would say, at, with my private practice while my parents watched our son. So that was that was kind of how we got nice. started and it's just evolved in crazy different ways than i ever would have imagined <laughs> from there yeah i mean we all have to do just what works as far as whether whether we're home whether we're at work or whether it's somewhere in between it's yes interesting. absolutely <laughs> and then what about you know um though when when you had a child what was that like for you emotionally and um coming into new motherhood can you can you get in with to that sort of space with us like you cut out for just a minute but we're talking about how i felt okay. coming into new motherhood right exactly okay. so um i i was the kind of mom that like i totally thought i had this on lockdown you know like the the pre mom i guess like so when i was pregnant like i I was a really good mom until I had kids. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you have all these ideas of like, oh, well, you know, like if you just show respect to your child and treat them respectfully, your child's gonna grow up to be a respectful child, right? Like that's how it works. No, not really. Uh, so like all these ideas that I like <laughs> just thought, well, like I can figure anything out. Like I figured out how to start my own businesses. Like I can do parenthood, you know, and I've worked with kids for my, most of my adult life. like. I got this. And then, and then we had one <laughs> and I felt like I had no clue, like despite all the preparation and all of the, I got this, once you're actually like holding that baby and you're taking that baby home and you're like, are you sure you want to let me take this thing home? Like, I don't know that that's a good choice. <laughs> so I would say overwhelm, probably the yeah. biggest emotion going into that. Overwhelm, yeah. I think that's a very relatable mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then when, you know, so now we're getting sort of fast forward a little bit. When did you first suspect that something was actually a little bit different about the way that your son was developing? What were some of the signs so, that stood out to you? So uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back on it, 
we had signs as early as probably six months that I can look back and be like, oh yeah, no, that wasn't, that's not normal. Um, but he was our first. And uh, when I was working, like all the clients I've ever worked with are like really severe, you know, so they have a lot of needs and a lot of problems. And so my, like my bias for like what's normal, quote unquote, was so skewed. And so like, it just, you know, like, it's like, okay, well, this child screams bloody murder if you try to put something on his feet. That's probably normal, right? That's like a normal baby thing. Babies just hate things on their feet. But like little stuff like that, that like, it just, that must just be it. Or, or I would say, oh, he's a little quirky. <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of quirkiness in the world. Um, and so it, we, we did that for, for quite a while. Uh, and then, okay, so he's four. So it was right after his third birthday a year ago. Um, we went on a trip and we were in a bathroom and there was like one of those super loud flushing toilet, like automatic flushing toilets, you know? Um, and so he, he was standing mm. right next to it when it went off and it scared him. And I was like, yeah, that was loud. Like, cool. No, wor no worries. Um, didn't think much of it. And then for the rest of that trip and like the next two weeks, he cried and screamed every time he had to go to the bathroom. And it was like, what is happening here? And so I was like, okay, well that's, that's too much. Like that was in my head where I was like, time out, let's go, let's, let's look at this a little deeper. And so I called one of my friends who's an occupational therapist and I was like, yeah, I just, you know, where's the line between like quirky and an actual problem when it comes to sensory stuff. And so she's like, well, just like write down all the things that you think are a little quirky. And I start writing this list and as I'm going down and there's more and more, it was like just kind of a light bulb where I was like, oh my god why did i not see this like i work with kids with special needs how did i miss this for three years so that was a little bit depressing when i realized that i just was oblivious hindsight is yeah. 20 yeah 20. <laughs> and like when you see it all on paper that's so much different than just looking at your kid you know and i like I totally get like, cause I, I would always do as a speech language pathologist, I would do those like developmental checklists with a parent and like walk them through this and like seeing that on their faces. And then having that ex same experience with my own kid, it was like, oh God, this is horrible. <laughs> Why do we do this? <laughs> but you have to get there. You know, you have to have that moment of, oh, okay, well we gotta fix this. Like there's actually something wrong now. <laughs> Right. So with prefacing this by the fact that, as we know from other like previous podcast episodes, which we've done with other, um, you know, speech language pathologists and occupational therapists who've described to us things about sensory processing and sensory processing disorder, many of the, we process sensory information in many different ways. Obviously, there are many different senses also. And what what one child, how one child experiences sensory input is a very different way from how another child does, especially when we're talking about a child who is sort of over and under mm -hmm. processing that information. So with that preface, can you tell us a little bit about what it what were some of those quirky mm -hmm. things? that that you yeah. noticed within your so time. um so he has some sensory systems he seems to over process like you said and some he seems to under process and so for example um like whole body movements like being able to move his body he seems to be under processing that in that he craves and needs so much movement just to keep his like center of of calm <laughs> you know and so he's he's my my climber my jumper my bouncer my like he's all bouncing off the walls most of the time uh we for christmas they got an eight foot trampoline in our playroom that's what we have in our playroom right now because like they need that then both of my kids are kind of like that and you know that's one of those things it's like oh well he's a little boy he's just an energetic little boy right like so many little boys are like that but he takes it to such an extreme where it's, you know, if he doesn't get that kind of sensory input all day long, then he's like screaming and throwing fits all day long. And it's like just this hot mess, you know? Um, so that was one where like he under processes. Sound is one that he 
over processes where too much sound is very he can really have trouble with that um you know like we couldn't run the vacuum around him we couldn't run the blender around him um and he was very self-aware of that and so he would actually advocate for himself which was awesome um so we'd be like you know cooking and he'd see the blender and he'd say whoa are you about to are you gonna do that because i'm gonna go over here and we're like okay yeah i'll wait go go ahead <laughs> you know and so like it was he was still functional you know it's not like he was not functioning he just had a lot of different issues when it came to some different sounds or um his brother was a big trigger for him so we had a baby when he was two and a half um and his little brother had uh, a bunch of allergies food allergies and that he was getting through what i was eating like through the breast milk um and so he pretty much just like screamed for a month straight until we got some of that settled down uh and so that the screaming obviously was like a huge trigger and then for some reason his brother touching him in any capacity was a trigger so that would completely set him off still does to us to an extent they're getting a little better now but like just just any sort of touch or sound from his brother was like we're done <laughs> and so you know imagine you, you can as you can imagine having two children in the same house that happens a lot <laughs> so it was it was yeah. just just <laughs> meltdowns all day long yeah. And so we've had, um, we had a wonderful occupational therapist, Jill Loftus, come and speak with us uh, about a month ago um, about sort of the difference between tantrums and sensory meltdowns. But can you give us in your own words and your own experience, how, how do you navigate that, the difference, and what are some of the ways that those things look different in so your So I will family? say I, I struggle with this sometimes is knowing is this a tantrum or a meltdown? Um, my general, like what I try to keep in my mind is um, a tantrum they're doing for a reason and a meltdown they're not in control of, you know? And so um, sometimes if I suspect it might just be a tantrum, I'll use like a quick trigger that I know will turn it off. Like, oh, did you know we have marshmallows in the cabinet? Like just to kind of test my theory almost, you know, not like I'm like rewarding you with a marshmallow every time you throw a fit, but like, if you can turn that off to go get your marshmallow, then that's like, okay, now I know that situation, you're just working it. <laughs> but usually the, yeah. the meltdowns are like, they will be triggered by a hair, you know, like something entirely minor happened, like he drops his sock, and then all of a sudden the world is ending. And you're like, that was weird. Like that didn't connect necessarily in my head as something you should tantrum about. And so that's kind of when I tend to think, okay, maybe we're on meltdown mode here, but it kind of blurs. Sometimes the lines definitely blur. It can. Do you feel like there are sort of the sensory meltdowns are connected that you can connect them to some sort of outside input that Sometimes that is triggering something. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes I have no clue. Um, because I think like right. sometimes it's like, oh, well, you just didn't move enough today. And so like, that's not a clear, it's hard to connect that. Um, sometimes I can yeah. say, oh yeah, looking back on it, like we had a lot of TV time this morning. That's probably where some of this is coming from. Um, or sometimes it's super obvious, like the toilet where you're like, okay, every time I put you on a toilet, now you're screaming like that. That one's pretty easy to figure out, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes I have no clue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I think it's because so many toddlers, all, all toddlers struggle with this ability to self-regulate, mm -hmm. but it, it's when you have this added factor of actually just the world <laughs> is difficult and it's not just my big emotions yes. that are yeah. difficult. Well, and I think one of the hardest things I've had to deal with is other people's feedback and perceptions on this because it's not a mm -hmm. diagnosis that most people know what it is. You know, if you explain it, most people are like, okay, I, that kind of makes sense. But like, okay, so from the outside, I have a kid who throws lots of fits and is really active. Okay, well, yeah, that like that does look like every other, sound like every other three-year-old boy, I get that. But then when you have someone being like, 
why do you think he has sensory processing disorder? Or why do you think he needs therapy? He's fine. He's just a little boy. Let him be a little boy. And it's like, okay, well, I think I know my kid better than you, but you know, maybe you're the expert on my kid. Let's, let's see what you do with it. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's see what happens if I, if sure. I let him stay with you for I a couple of hours. Let's, let's see, see what happens. <laughs> right. Ooh, so what are some, I mean, if you could, sort of do a little bit of education with those people <laughs> and in your best self, right? When, when you're not like engaged in that emotional, like defensiveness, yeah. what, what would you say to that? So I try to, I try to phrase it in ways that I think it'll make sense to other people. You know, if I feel like they're receptive to that, if, you know, sometimes I'm like, yeah, you're right. Little kids uh -huh, move on. But if it's like a family member or somebody who's going to be around us a lot, I like to phrase it as like, okay, well, you know, he experiences sensory information differently. So sometimes the things he experiences, like sounds, they come in really loud. It it's comes in hot and heavy and too much and he can't handle it. And sometimes things come in really quietly and he doesn't feel them enough, like the movement. And so he needs to do more of that. And all of that keeps his brain, I like to use the fight or flight kind of analogy is like he's in fight or flight mode all the time because of this bombardment of sensory information that he can't process. And so when you're in fight or flight, then every little thing sets you off all day long and then you can't sleep at night and then you're sleep deprived and you're in the, it, it just, it's just really hard to be him. <laughs> so that's generally how I explain it. <laughs> I think um, also that that sense of this is a cycle, actually, this is a cyclical effect. And the more, the more we can support that not to happen, mm -hmm. the, the easier his life and, and all of our lives will yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, okay, Carrie, let's take a, just a brief break to hear a word from our sponsor. And then we are going to hear a few tips and resources from Carrie about the kinds of tips and resources that have been most helpful for her as a parent. Parenthood is the great equalizer. Regardless of cultural, linguistic, or socioeconomic background, all parents face that enormous responsibility of raising humans. We help parents and caregivers feel nurtured so you can find the joy and the mayhem. We weren't meant to parent in isolation. The Community Lab is a content and community hub that brings you peace of mind. You have what matters when you need it most bite-sized morsels of developmental information, activity ideas to apply right now, parent support groups so you can feel empowered and supported in your parenting, developmental music classes, unprecedented access to professionals and special guests like the one we have today, and an active, engaged community of others like you. The Community Lab is an all-in-one resource that is not one-size-fits-all. To take your free one-week trial and join us for everything I've just described, as well as member access to Q&A sessions with the featured guests, come check out community.strengthandwords.com. All right, Carrie, what are those things that have actually been helpful <laughs> for you as a parent of a child with sensory processing disorder, right? One parent to another, many parents to you. What is one or several things that you'd like to convey to others who might suspect their child has high sensory? Uh, okay, so a couple of things. First of all, every kid's different. So don't feel like if I give you a strategy and it doesn't work that you're doing it wrong or there's something weird about your kid. No, they're all they're all different. And especially when you come up with come against issues like sensory stuff, you know, everybody's gonna have something that works differently. Um, I think the most important thing is just go get help. You know, don't feel like you have to suffer through this alone. Don't feel like you have to try to figure it out on your own because there's somebody who already knows all this information in their head and they can they can give that to you. <laughs> so don't feel like you have to do it alone. Um, but I would say like in terms of tips that have helped at home, the biggest thing for us is heavy work, which is this concept of getting your, your child to do something with their body do something that approaches maximal effort. So they're doing, they're using their muscles, they're using their breath, they're moving their body fully. I think our lifestyle these days is really, it's very sedentary. It's very, we don't move enough. You know, we're not out on the farm milking, most of us are not out on the farm milking cows and collecting eggs and all that thing, all those things all day. If that was the case, my son would be a rock star. I'll tell you what, he would be the rock star of the farm. <laughs> Like 
we should live on a farm probably mm -hmm. because he like he that's what he needs he needs movement he needs exercise he needs a job he needs a purpose um and so sometimes we have to build that into our day and and be cognizant of that while i'm planning activities or while i'm suggesting things to do um okay so heavy work uh, i actually have a pinterest board maybe i can find the link to that that i started taking great we'll put it in the show perfect notes. I just started taking pictures of my son doing different things that I was like, oh, he he's really into this and it's helping his body. I just would take a picture and put it on a Pinterest board. And no joke, it was for me. Like it's on my Pinterest board for the speech and language kids brand. Cause I'm like, other people probably could use this too. But it, it was just cause I will sit there going, oh my God, we're having one of those days. Like he's so crazy. What could I do right now that would help? And I'll, oh, I got a Pinterest board for that. So then I just go through and like look for the things that will work. Um, and so things like we have a little mini vacuum, like a, you know, like a hand vac and we, we put it on the ground and he crawls and pushes it and vacuums up like under the table. We do that after every meal, even if it doesn't need vacuuming, he loves it. He thinks he has a job that's really important, which he does. I mean, I would like my, my floor vacuumed, uh, but it also helps <laughs> his body. And so, um, you know, I will, I will say he's better with sounds now so that the sound of that doesn't bother him. Mm -hmm. um, but things like mm -hmm. that where they have to push or pull, um, stacking chairs, moving chairs. Oh, I'm trying to think of what some of the other ones are. Um, blowing and sucking is actually really mm -hmm. helpful for him, which seems weird. As in through a straw. Yeah, because it, it se doesn't seem like a whole body movement. But if you have, like, for example, if you have a, a thick smoothie and you have him drink it through a thin straw or just, I mean, a normal straw, he has to suck really hard, which which works his abs and his diaphragm and all of that, or um, like get a straw and blow cotton balls across the table. He has to really focus and use a lot of breath to do that. So sucking, blowing, chewing, we have we give him crunchy foods a lot. Um, yeah, so lots of heavy work, that, lots of getting his body moving and doing maximal effort kinds of things. That's great. Wonderful. We actually also have um, a previous episode of the Strength in Words podcast with Mama OT, Christy Kylie of Mama OT, who gave us some wonderful ideas for heavy work. And I'll link to that as nice. well. Nice. I love it. That's great, Perry. Yeah. Excellent. The other thing that helped us quite a bit was we did about six months of therapy with a, um, a chiropractor who's local mm -hmm. in my area. Um, and he went through a special training and I wish I could say what the name of the training is or where he got it. But um, it's it's basically like brain integration kind of exercises where it's trying to it's looking at primitive reflexes. So things like, you know, the reflexes that babies have, um, like when you touch their palm and they grab your hand, that's the palmer reflex. Um, so for him, for whatever reason, those reflexes that should have gone away in the first year of his life he held on to those to some extent. And it was really interesting because mm. we sat down with this chiropractor and he tested these things. Like he would tickle the palm of his hand. Like for me, I'm just like, oh, that kind of feels funny. You know, like no big deal. Um, he did that to my son and he was like, get it off. And was like rubbing his hand and like, oh, yuck, oh. And like, I had never noticed that reaction before, but I'd also never tried tickling the palm of his hand. Why would I do that? And right. so like, Right. That like that was just like an indication that his nervous system is not it's not all integrated. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing in whatever capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so we did about six months of therapy with him of these sp very specific re or exercises that work the brain to integrate those reflexes. Um, mm -hmm. And so we did that along with some chiropractic adjustments. Um, and he does like diet modification stuff too, to like avoid allergens and triggers and that kind of thing. Um, and so that was really helpful. I, we need to go back and do another round probably. Um, but we were doing really well for a little bit. So I was like, yeah, let's kind of see how we do. And, you know, it kind of cycles. Um, but yeah, that was really helpful. So his program is called Elevating Kids. And um, I, they are currently working on getting that system. They're working on getting that system online. Um, I think they're going to put it on teachable so you can actually buy like the exercises um, and watch the videos and do them at home. Uh, but their website's elevating-kids.com. So that would be the cool. resource that I really liked. Very cool. Um, oh, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, is there any other favorite resource for parents interested in learning more in general that you have? Um, I'm trying to think. I did read a couple books. 
I think um, I think it was the out of sync child has fun. I think that one was a really good one because it um, had a bunch of different activities and games in it that I thought was really helpful. I feel like, you know, being in my profession, I understood sensory process pretty well. So I didn't need like to read up on what it is and how it's functioning. And honestly, like that doesn't help me anyway. What do I do right now with my kid? So I liked the out of sync child has fun because it's activities, but there, there's also the out of sync child. Maybe that's just what it's called, the, the original. For more background information and basic. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great resource. Yeah. So I think Excellent. those are my top ones, my top resources. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. Well, thanks so much. And thanks to all our community lab members who are listening here live. We are going to continue the discussion and open up for a Q&A session for you guys in just a minute. But for everyone listening from home or on the go, thanks so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye. Excellent.